Let's do it. So, our first step, our first stop today is these slides. And I guess I'll put this up here while it's trying to be in my way. Let's get right into it. So we were talking about bitwise operators last time, and I have a very completely different thing to talk about this time. So bitwise operators, cool. We can access individual bits, set them, get them, toggle them. I would like to talk to you about something with uh, just a lot of words today. Sit back, relax, listen to me talk about what it's going to be like when you become a big shot software developer. You're a software engineer working in industry, let me talk to you about how you're going to be building software, if this is going to be your, your chosen field. All right. Thank you to Bill Kearney, the other computer science professor here, made these slides. I stole a lot of them from him. But yeah, here's a fun little uh, comic that kind of tells you what to expect when you become a software developer. Feel free to take a little bit to read this. But... Now yeah, there's this age-old issue of you're trying to make software for somebody and they're telling you what they want with words and they usually can't explain themselves very well. There's going to be a disconnect between what they want and what they tell you they want and then also what you hear, okay? So there's, uh, there's a lot going on there and everybody else, like your managers, they all have different skin amounts of skin in the game, right? And so everybody's going to interpret things according to their worldview, according to what they got going on in their lives. Okay. So this is a comical representation of, of that kind of idea. Okay. So not software development or just any other job in a nutshell, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, here is essentially how the software game Somebody's like, you You work for a company, they get a contract from somebody, they're like, all right, I'm going to give you a million dollars, please make me this software in a year, all right? That's the, that's the conversation your boss has or something, and then the question is, what happens now? What happens after, like, you agree to build software, okay? There's a lot of competing options, all right? So here are... Uh, here are the ideas. Steps for building complicated software, because simple software definitely doesn't cost a million dollars, right? So here are the like the traditional steps, the traditional steps that people would go through to build some large software. It revolves around this little circular diagram, design, requirement, analysis, design, implementation, testing, evolution, and just all repeat. So this will make sense after I explain it. So here's the traditional order. So the first step, once you've been you've agreed to make somebody some software, you have to figure out what you're doing, right? Like what, what do they actually want? So that's called the requirements phase or the analysis phase, right? You got to figure out what in the world does this customer who gave me money really want? Ask them a million times, talk to them, go talk to their employees, figure out exactly what they're trying to do and what you're trying to build, right? Uh, a good idea is to figure out what are called use cases, like how is the software going to be used? Like how is this particular employee going to use the software in their day job? How is this other employee going to use, going to use this software differently in their day job? What, what use cases do you have to cover? How is the software going to be used? Right? Very generic, it could be anything that you're building. It could be a website, it could be a program, it doesn't matter, okay? Then, uh, we, we say that that takes about two months of the year that you're you're given, right? So about two months to figure out what you're actually doing, write it all down, and then comes the design phase or the specification generation phase. That takes another two months, right? So uh, before you actually start writing the code, we haven't done it, we haven't touched any code yet. You have to write down exactly what you're going to do with the code, right? Figure out every function, every class, everything, and how it's all going to work together because you need that initial structure, right? Once you figure out what the use cases are, you can start designing your classes and the functions and the methods that all interact between each other, right? Plan how each unit of code connects to the others, right? Everything needs to connect. Nothing should be out of place. You need like a million classes with a million methods. You'll figure it out in this design phase, right? And 
The planning is very, very important because this is a giant piece of software. You're going to have a bunch of different groups, each with a bunch of different people, right, working on it. You need to spell out exactly what needs to happen here. Because otherwise, if it's not spelled out, it's going to be done wrong. It's not good. Okay. So requirements phase two months, design phase two months. A third of the year is gone. You haven't written any code yet at all. That All that upfront stuff needs to be done. All right. Then actually write the code. And you can finally write the code. That only takes three months. Three months out of the year to do. All right. And then hope that the programmers that uh, you have employed under you are following the specifications that you wrote down in the design phase. All right. So relatively short amount of time, like three, six, a fourth, a quarter of the year is only writing code, right? Only a quarter of the year is spent writing code. The rest is everything else, right? Designing, require, getting requirements, talking to the customer. Then another three months, exactly the same amount of time that you spent writing the code, you have to test it, right? Make sure there's no bugs or make sure there's a minimal amount of bugs, I guess. Make sure every function that you talked about, that you designed, every class that you designed is doing exactly what it should do, given input that's going to look like what the customer is going to use. All right? Make sure every function slash class works together properly. So check that they interact with each other correctly. All right? That they all work together. Integration testing. All that. Uh, and then finally, you got to get some people like pretending to be the people bought your code. Maybe bring them in too. But you have to be testing the entire piece of software, that whole website. Go through the entire checkout phase, whatever you're doing. Uh, maybe this is a PowerPoint program. Make sure that you can make a presentation, display it, save it, all that kind of stuff. Everything that it should be able to do, test the whole thing right, at a high level. All that kind of testing needs to be done over and over and over again until it starts to look great. Okay, that's the idea. Oops. Yeah, press Alt. There we go, I did it. I remembered. So, testing phase, just as long as the, the coding phase, funny enough. And <clears throat> how much time do we have left? Six, four, we got two months left. Uh, then, step five, actually give it to your customer who just gave you a bunch of money and waited. Uh, have them try it out and make sure it's working the right way, and it probably won't be some things that they want, uh, and then debug. One, one month at the very end, debug. The customer's going to find some bugs you didn't find, fix those. Uh, they're going to notice that they need extra things that they didn't tell you about at the beginning, implement those, uh, and then maybe they ask for a lot and you have to like start this whole process over again. All right, here are some new things that you need to implement. Okay, so it really is a cycle of Analyze what you need to do, figure out the classes, design it, classes and functions and methods, how they interoperate, implement the stuff, test the stuff, give it to the person again to tell you what went wrong, what they need changed, and then you start all over again with those new ideas that they gave you. Okay? Does that make sense? That's like the traditional software engineering timeline, time frame. That's kind of how it works. Any comments about this? Like, does this sound like a good idea? Could we think of a better way? Or does this seem like a good thing? Like, this is traditionally how it used to be done. And it is done like this in several places still. But yeah, there's a bunch of competing ideas. They all think about these different phases in different ways, I guess. Uh, and they're called programming paradigms. Okay, so essentially the one that I just taught you is called Waterfall. It's called the Waterfall Programming Paradigm. And it was, all right, take all these steps, do them in order. Nothing can be done out of order. You cannot be coding while you're designing, while you're gathering requirements. You cannot be testing while you're coding. It all happens in order. Okay, that's Waterfall. It's very, very rigorous, very set in stone. All right, so there are pros and cons to all of this. Right? There are pros and cons to all of this. In Waterfall, the, the idea that I just talked about, the pro is, well, everything that we 
uh, are trying to do. It's been documented. It's written down somewhere. We can check the documentation, make sure what we're doing is correct. That's a great thing. There's a paper trail with Waterfall. Very nice. All right. Uh, the cons are uh, a lot. People like to, to hate on Waterfall. It has its place, but most software development places these days do not enjoy Waterfall and do not use it. There are several reasons. The first is it's not flexible. Maybe the the uh, maybe you're in your coding stage or you're in the design stage or the coding stage or the testing stage, and the, the customer comes back and they're like, hey, I need you to add this, please. I need this now. I, I just remembered it. I want you to add it. If you were in Waterfall, you would say no. You would say, okay, wait till the end of this cycle. We'll do it again later. Uh, we are in the middle of implementing the stuff that we just designed in the design phase. I don't want to hear from you right now. Okay, so it's very, uh, very inflexible. Uh, another issue is customers, just everybody's human, right? Nobody knows what they really want until they're shown something and they're like, oh, that's not right. Let's change that. Okay, that's just, it's a very philosophical lecture today, I would say. Not a lot of code. Uh, so yeah, then you have your programmers who are working for you or you are the programmer. Uh, they might notice that like something would be a lot easier if we coded it up this way, if we changed our design. But you can't change your design in the coding phase if you're in Waterfall. Right? The design phase already happened. Don't think about design. It's just code, code, code right now. Right? So that is, uh, that's, that's Waterfall. It, uh, it's good for some things, like a lot of government contractors, they have to use Waterfall. That's just the way that their contract is laid out. Things like that. They are given a list of requirements at the very beginning. They need to go and implement them all. That's how some people like to have their code built for them. But yeah, this is just another diagram of kind of the same thing with a, bit, a few more details involved. But there's a lot of documentation being made, right? A lot of ideas, uh, a lot of specifications. Just specify it all up front, then build it, right? That's the idea then give it to the customer. Any questions about this? So this is called Waterfall. If you take a software engineering class at a four-year college, and I encourage you all to do that, uh, you will learn about this definitely. All these different phases that I'm talking about in this lecture, you will go over in detail in a software engineering class. All right, are you ready to go on to the next programming paradigm? A little more hip. It is called Agile. Maybe we've heard about this. If you look at all the memes on, like, whatever the programming subreddit is, you'll see a lot of these words, and now you know about them, all right? So let's talk about agile programming. What's the difference, all right? So agile, they take the same idea, like all these requirements, specification, coding, testing, debugging, give it to the customer to, t to try it out. They still do all those things, but they do it a lot quicker. Not in a year, but like a month. Do that all in a month, then do it all over again, okay? They work on very small chunks of things so they can get stuff out to the, to the customer faster so that they can see results, give feedback, say what they want to have changed, all that kind of stuff. So that's what Agile is all about. Doing those things quickly, all right? Take a month instead of a year, all right? Do a little incremental additions at a time, okay? The cons of Agile are, there's a few, uh, when you're designing things every month, new things, new things, new things, all of your programmers who want to be involved, they usually, like, they notice, okay, I just heard about this cool new uh, thing on Hacker News, let's use that for this new feature, all that kind of stuff. So you kind of lose a little bit of time there because, uh, you, you can't just design everything up front. Now you have to design things incrementally, and everybody wants to have a say in how it's designed. That does take a while. So uh, that's an issue. Uh, it's also agile programming is perceived by humans as more stressful because the time frame is short. It's like, I don't have a year to do this. I have a month to implement this feature. I am a programmer. I need to get this in. Okay, so that's uh, the ideas behind agile. It's... Uh, I guess their mantra is release quickly, release often, so that they can get stuff to the customer, get the results back, get their feedback, make sure that everything is working. So yeah, release quickly, 
so that you can catch bugs, change stuff. All right? So their cycles tend to be about a month, plus or minus a couple weeks, maybe a two-week cycle uh, in uh, a six-week cycle. And usually these are called sprints. Like everybody's running to the finish line, designing some stuff, working on their particular features that they are tasked with implementing, making sure it works with everybody's everybody else's code, who's everybody's working at the same time, right? Make sure two things don't break each other. Test it, write tests, make sure that the client sees it, get their feedback, and then change your requirements, right? It's a cycle, but it's a faster cycle. They're called sprints. So that's what Agile is all about. All right. Uh, I guess the age all, these are the two real competing programming paradigms, Agile versus Waterfall. And so uh, I guess we should talk about them together, right? Uh, waterfall, it's, it's trying to predict the future, and there are some issues with that. Uh, but maybe it's a good idea if, if you know that things aren't going to change. Uh, agile is very much about like I gotta move fast. I gotta respond to what's going on in the present. All right. So I guess here's my question for you: which which of these two would you guys prefer? What do you think? What are our comments thoughts? Which one would you want to be working with? A software development company. I want to work for one that does waterfall style programming. I want to work for one that's an agile style place. What do we think? Yeah, there's, there's no right answer here. Maybe waterfall is more thorough, gives you more time to work on stuff, yeah? Yeah, changes are a lot easier in an agile style environment. That's exactly right. So that's that's the tug and pull right there. Uh, here is I'm hiding this for a reason. Uh, they did a study and it showed that agile is 200 to 300 percent more likely to result in a successful project. Like everything is ending on time. That's what I mean by successful versus waterfall. Usually with waterfall, there's some delays at the end. They're like, all right, we have a lot of things to add. We need, we need more money now from the customer. Please pay our programmers to do all these changes that you wanted uh, to include. Okay. So for that reason, most uh, companies these days use some form of agile approach, unless you're like a government contractor and you're forced to use waterfall in some way. Okay. That's the idea. And so that's what you can expect in industry. Uh, here are the I, uh, here's some more graphs from some studies being done. So waterfall uh, versus agile. These are pie charts of like a bunch of projects that people worked on, and did they did they end successfully? Successfully means like I gave you a year to build this. You built it in a year. You didn't cost me any extra money. That's that's what successful means. Challenged means they were over budget over budget on, like, they needed more money, uh, they noticed, or they needed more time to implement the thing. They noticed that. And then failed is just, like, they gave up. The customer got something that wasn't what they wanted. Or they just didn't accept it at all, kind of thing. So notice the, the huge difference here. Uh, in terms of successful projects, Agile is the clear winner. Because you can get that feedback so quickly, you can usually get what the user wants. You can get what the customer wants customer wants. You can get at that, that underlying idea of what they need quickly because you keep showing them your product, right? The product they asked for. So it's staggering, right? Almost over twice as many successful projects with Agile compared comparatively. Uh, about the same amount of challenged projects. Usually the customer's like, I can only spend this much, but everybody learns eventually that like, okay, we need to pay a little bit more for these features. Kinds of things. So kind of the same there in terms of challenge. Or maybe they're like, we need a little bit more time. So no real difference there. But failed is also a huge difference. You see that? Projects fail a little bit less when they're agile. They can react to changes. Like maybe with waterfall, you made something for the customer that a year from now, like when you're giving it to them, they're like, oh, everything changed for us. We don't need that anymore. 
So that's a big, a big difference. You can work with them with an agile environment. Okay. So that is my pie chart. Are there any questions about uh, the difference between the two? Again, very high level ideas. Go to Wikipedia, look these up if you're interested. Uh, this may one day be your future. You should have a say in it. You know about all the, the fancy buzzwords. We're doing all right. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is just the subtype of the agile environment. So really not a lot of programming today. I'll give you one example in just a little bit, but that'll be the one example of the day uh, with code. Uh, the next kind of environment is a kind of agile, a, a way of doing agile called Scrum, which has gained popularity and you'll see it a lot, or you'll, you'll at least see features of it in a lot of agile environments. It's called Scrum, it's a funny little word. Uh, very popular. It's just a version of Agile. Uh, and here's how it works. Here's how Scrum works. So what you do is you come up with like uh, a bunch of requirements. You establish what's called a definition of done. Uh, and maybe that means like, all right, the program passes all the tests that we wrote, something like that. You define what it means for a feature to be complete ahead of time. That's your like planning stage. What it means for a piece of the project to be done. And then you generate a list of things that need to be done based on those ideas, right? And that's called a backlog. You create a product backlog, which holds a bunch of tasks, and you, you kind of give up, give those tasks out if you're the manager. You give the tasks out to your programmers. And those are the things that remain to be done, right? Those could be features. They could be bug fixes. They, like, you can add to the backlog as you're going if you notice some bugs. Uh, you need to write some documentation. You need to write some tests. So all those things get part, uh, get part become uh, part of the backlog. And usually you give them a priority, like, all right, the bug fixes are very important. The features are very important. We need all of these. Maybe documentation is not as important, at least to, to programmers, we think that, right? Uh, so usually they're all marked with priorities, how much risk is involved, how much time we think it's going to take. Uh, these They're all estimates, though. Usually you notice as you're implementing it, that's that's when you can really tell how long it's going to take, right? Something like that. Uh, and then there's an idea of like somebody gets to play pretend, somebody gets to play the product owner. Uh, so there's like, uh, it's kind of like theater in a sense. There's somebody who gets to pretend to be the client who is just a person who works at your company. And they, they're the ones who are managing the backlog and the priorities. They're called the product owner. Okay, so it's like, the manager or somebody like that. And so that's Scrum in a nutshell. Um, and here's the funny bit. There is somebody called the Scrum Master who is, again, part of the company like a manager. So you have a Scrum Master, and if you're a program, if you're a programmer, uh, you're working underneath a Scrum Master who's telling you what to do, all right? They guide the process. They, uh, they talk to the CEO, make sure like they're on the same page. Uh, they're just somebody who can deal with people uh, so that the programmers don't have to, right? Who can go to the meetings so that the programmers don't have to. That's what the Scrum Master does. So they're, they're just in charge of the process. And that's such a disgusting uh, like corporate term to say. It's, it's, this is a business process, right? <laughs> Scrum Master, all right? And usually, the, that's where Sprint came from. It's from Scrum. Uh, usually they're building stuff on a sprint that lasts about two weeks. Two weeks sprint. Try to get through your backlog and implement your features. Right? At the start of your sprint, usually it's two weeks long or so, very short, there is a planning stage, planning event, where everybody just like looks at the backlog, takes the highest priority stuff off of it, and they're like, we are going to focus on these things from the backlog for this particular sprint. Right? That's the idea. Those make a new backlog called the sprint backlog. So I don't know. You have like your main backlog. Main backlog. Which has a bunch of things that you've like prioritized. Five, three, two, etc. And then you take some of those, like you take a couple of them, and you put them onto your sprint backlog. These are just the things that you're going to choose to do this particular sprint. Not as many. Those are the things you're going to try to get done in these two weeks. All right? And then you assign those out to programmers, and you're off to the races. You get started. Okay? Then 
What happens every day, and this is a very, very common thing that you'll see in industry, even if you're not particularly like scrum only, like you're just agile, you'll see this a lot. We did this at every single internship I've ever had. You do at the beginning of the day, you like you all get in a room together, you stand up or you sit down. It's supposed to be you stand up so that everybody like knows that we can leave soon. Uh, but you have very short meetings each day uh, until the end of your sprint. And that's called like your daily scrum. And everybody goes around, you go around in a circle, you group this in some way. So there's not a million people in the room, but uh, you have a bunch of people, you get them together, they're all working on stuff. And everybody go around, take like 15 minutes. Each member of the group says they talk about what they did before, the day before, what they were working on, uh, what they're going to do today, and anything that like is stopping their progress. Because they're working with stuff with other people usually on, on some features. They're like, I need this in order to do that kind of thing. And so they can kind of coordinate at the start of the day very quickly uh, so that they can get all this stuff done. Okay, so uh, yeah, usually you'll see this at every place, every software corporation. Even if you don't do Scrum specifically, they usually steal this idea of a daily stand-up meeting that was supposed to be called daily Scrum, right? That's the idea. So everybody talks about what they're working on, and they go and do it for the rest of the day. Uh, and yeah, each day the team members, they work through the sprint backlog, trying to like cross stuff off their list. Like, this is done. This is done. I need to work on this now. And that's that's essentially the process. I know that's that's just a, dis a disgusting word for me to say, but that's, that's what you got to do in industry. This is the way you work. Any questions about that? Again, just, a, uh, just an idea. These are ways that people build software. You can imagine it gets complicated. It needs to be this complicated because the software you're building that complicated, right? So here's a fun example of all that. You got your original backlog. It's just a list of all the things you're going to do uh, in total, all the things you need to do. And then you take a few of those for your current sprint, which is like two weeks, a month, whatever you want it to be. That makes your sprint backlog. And then from there, you work on those, right? Every 30 days is a new sprint. And every 24 hours, you change stuff add stuff to the backlog, you remove stuff if you fit, if you uh, if you implemented it. So slowly but surely, like you're, you're chopping through the backlog, and at the end of 30 days, at the end of the sprint, you have a little piece, uh, you have a new version of the software that you're building. And you can give it to the customer, have them try it out, all that kind of stuff. But it's supposed to be working at the end, okay? So that's a diagrammatic form of what's going on there. All right, any questions about any of that? Again, very philosophical. It's just ideas that people noticed work for them. They gave it a name. All right, so at the very end of those two weeks or your month, however long, you, however long your sprint is, there usually is a meeting at the end, just like there was a meeting at the start, where everybody like get, goes around and uh, you, you figure out, like, hey, did we actually do what we like, did we complete our backlog? What went well? What what ruined our time? Like, how can we how can we make this better next time? Maybe we had some issues, uh, and then of course you give it to the customer after all that. Okay, so yeah, a very nice idea that came from Scrum is that like everything is time limited. So like, thirty days to do this. It's 15 minutes for this meeting. No more. We're going to walk out of the room after 15 minutes. Stuff like that. Which is a really good idea, right? So that you don't sit in a meeting all day long. So that's a nice thing that Scrum came up with. Like, we, we value each other's time. Let's let's get these things done. That's the idea. So that's, that's their philo philosophy. And this is a very common thing to see uh, at the end of a, of a sprint, or just while you're working on one. It's called a burn-down chart. So... Uh, here is like a list of tasks, and you want to see the list of tasks get smaller over time. You want to get to zero tasks at the end, uh, and slowly but surely, like you might add some tasks, but eventually it's going to go down. So ideally, it would be a nice straight line, and hopefully you end at zero each time. But uh, sometimes that doesn't happen, and you have to like add new stuff, keep keep pieces of your old backlog for the new one. So 
like that. Uh, and usually you organize it in terms of estimated time that you're going to need to work on this stuff. So you, you have your time estimates for each piece of your backlog, and you're like, all right, this is going to take 250-ish total hours for all of these things on the backlog, and then hopefully, like, all of your estimates were correct, and as things get checked off, you have less total effort to, to give, right? less total work to do, and eventually you're done, right? And then you can also keep track of, like, the remaining tasks. That should also get small, okay? So you can do it in time, in terms of time, or just total tasks. Either way, you want them both to go to zero, right? Some days you might make no progress. Everybody's working on some very hard thing. But then you have a bunch of stuff that you turn in on day 11, okay? Even if there was no work on day 10. That's the idea. That's a burn down chart. That's how you might uh, see it one day. And that is, I think, everything that I wanted to say about Scrum. So it's just a type of agile development where they, they really like to have people at the top that like manage everything, scrum master, product owner, you got your sprints that you're working on, stuff from your backlog, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, am I good with that? So these are just a bunch of ideas today, just a lot of words. Uh, the very final one is something that we've secretly been using in this class. It's called TDD. It is test-driven development. That's what it stands for. And everything that you turn in is graded with tests. I've had you write tests. You've kind of been using TDD. Right? TDD stands for test-driven development. And uh, here's how it works. What you're supposed to do with test-driven development is, you know how Waterfall was like, all right, we're going to write code and then test it. With test-driven development, they do that in the reverse order. Believe it or not, they write their tests first. They swap the testing phase and the coding phase. You write the test before you write the code. So that you know, like, if these pass, we actually wrote the test, or we actually wrote the code correctly, right? You figure out how everything is going to be used ahead of time. So it's kind of another, uh, it's helpful in design as well. That's what they noticed, the test-driven test development people, right? And so the tests will guide you as you implement your code. That's the, that's the hope, right? Kind of how the tests are guiding you as you implement your labs, right? So uh, their, their little mantra is red-green refactor. So right before you start implementing, like all your tests, they fail, right? Because you haven't implemented anything yet or you made stubs. And so all the tests start out red, and then the more that you implement, you start seeing them all pass, and that's apparently green, right? The more the tests turn green. And then, once you've got all your tests to pass, or most of them, you notice, like, all right, I wrote this just in a way to pass the test. I need to generalize this code. I need to make it work for more things than just the testing code, okay? So you, you do what's called a refactoring. You refactor your code. That just means clean it up, add comments to document it, stuff like that. So write the tests. Initially, they all fail. That's red. Then get them all working or mostly working. And then start cleaning up the stuff that you're writing, just because uh, maybe you worked quickly. Clean it up so that other people can read your code, uh, document it in case of bugs, so that people can come back and see, like, OK, this is what this was supposed to do. Let's make sure it does that. OK? And then it's time to do it all over again. You have a new feature to work on, add its test cases, and then code. So tests before code. Tests. We're driven by the tests. Test-driven development. So it's just a cycle of red-green refactor. That's what they like to say. Okay? And so we've essentially been doing this. At least I've given you the tests up front. So you've kind of been forced into test-driven development in your labs this whole time. Right? Same with your Zybook stuff. So yeah, there's pros and cons to every one of these. So you, uh, most software companies, they pick what they like from all these different uh, programming paradigms. And that's, that's a natural thing to want to do. Okay? So yeah, there's pros and cons to all this, including TDD. Uh, pros of TDD. If you have a very good test suite, right, you can pretty be pretty confident that the stuff you're writing isn't going to break the old stuff because you still have tests for the old stuff, right? And those should keep passing, yes? So it's just constantly adding new tests and you better not be breaking the old ones. 
That's the idea. So that's helpful. That's a pro. Uh, another pro is if you break something, usually you have a previous version of your code you can go back to. Uh, like, it's, it's not a big deal. Right? Everybody's using version control software. They're using Git, stuff like that. Uh, and so you can be brave. Try and get this passing. If it doesn't work, that's cool. Do it a different way. You have, you have tests to back you up. You have tests to know when you're done. Okay, so those are some pros of TBD. Uh, some cons are uh, tests can take a while. They're like, we've written unit tests in our code, right? They're just functions that do stuff. You can imagine that there are some like long running tests that you can write. Like, all right, read this giant file, read Shakespeare, and make sure our code works on that. Try that for a bunch of different giant books or something. I don't know. So it might take a long time to run the test, so you're not really sure if what you did was right, if it doesn't break anything. That's a con. Uh, maybe you have to like run all your tests at night, or you just repeatedly run them, continuous, continuously. Continuous integration is the fancy term for that. Uh, so, yeah, that's a con. Uh, another con is you might be blinded by the tests that you write. You might not write the correct tests. Because usually it's the programmer who's about to write the feature who's writing the tests for that feature as well, right? So maybe the, the tests have a blind spot that that programmer didn't think about and that the code is going to reflect that and vice versa, right? So the programmer might have written the wrong tests to begin with or they weren't thorough enough. And so when you see green, you think it's done, but it really isn't. Hmm. That's a con. So you maybe need a bunch of people looking over the tests. There's a way to solve that, of course. Uh, again, tests, they might need to be updated when the code changes, when the requirements change. Like this thing was supposed to do this before, but the customer came and says, all right, it needs to do this other thing now. And so you have to change every test that involved that thing, right? That you had passing for the old version of the requirement, but oh man, now it's a different requirement. So another con. And then finally is there are some things that are just untestable. You can't test experiences like, oh God, I hate the way Facebook looks this now. I hate the way Duolingo looks. That is a true statement coming from me at least because they changed everything. Uh, you can't test that. You can't write a test for like, all right, Duolingo is fun for me to use, right? You have to give that to a human. You have to have them try it out, right? Like a game, like a graphical user interface. You have to try a bunch of different things. You have to give those to humans. There's not just a test you can click and have a computer run. Okay. So there are some things that are just inherently untestable that you really want to be there. Okay. So that is TDD in a nutshell. Are there any questions about that? That's kind of something that you've been working on. Oops. Where were we? So if we're okay, I have one example for the day. I'd like to give you an example of TDD. Let's just do it the way they, they say to do it. So write the tests first and make everything incorrect originally. That's what stubs. The word stub is from test-driven development, by the way. You start your functions out as incorrect stubs and then we'll make it work. So let's make a, a set third bit function and a is third bit function that do bitwise stuff. Let's remember that. So let's say we have a variable X that's set to some number. It's stored in binary, of course. One, zero, one. And so here is bit zero, one, two, three. So we're going to write a program that like checks the third bit of X. Like is third bit set or return false if it's a zero, true if it's a one. And then set third bit will take a number and set it, change it to have a one in that bit position. Yeah. So let's, let's do this in test driven development style. Uh, so yeah, it's just empty. TDD example. Dot CVP. So the goal of test-driven development is you write the tests first, tests first, then code. We can write the declarations of these things at least. Let's say that set third because you need to know how you're going to interact with it. You have to know how to call it in your tests. So we have set third bit. It's going to take a number. Uh, do we want to? Right, let's take it by reference so that we just change it can be a void function. Set third bit and pool is third bit set. 
So int x. So it takes a number and returns true if the third bit is set. This one sets the third bit. Okay, of the number. That will be the idea. And so that's the declarations of those functions. And now let's write a bunch of tests with assert true. So, oh gosh, where is assert true? Where's a good place for me to get it right now? Uh, I guess I can do this. This is useful. Uh, do I have this installed? Cool. Uh, I have implemented a cert true. I have it from lecture 15. So let's go there. Boop. Assert true. I need that. Back to today's folder. So yeah, we're writing tests, so we need to search true, of course. And I don't know, let's just implement them all up here, why not? So I don't know, void test set third bit. And we'll have a test is third bit set function as well. So let's come up with some tests. Test is third bit set. Alright? So, what are some good tests? Well, for setting the third bit, we got to give it a number, make sure it actually did the thing, right? So let's give it a number with the third bit set, right? One, zero, one, one, zero, one, two, three. Let's give it, let's give it this number. The third bit is already set. What is that in uh, binary or in decimal? That's going to be one, two, four, eight. So eight plus two plus one, that's 11. So let's try it with 11, and it shouldn't change it, right? Because the third bit's already set. It should still be 11 after I try to set it. It's already set. Okay? Let's give it another number with the third bit unset. Like, I don't know. Let's do 0, 0, 1, 1. And that is just 3 base 10. Let's try to set that. It should be turned into 11, right? It should be turned into 11. Right? If we set this to a 1, it better become 11. So those could be two good tests. One with it already set, making sure it doesn't mess with anything, and then one with it unset so that it gets changed. So test set third bit. So here's my int x. I don't know, let's start it at 11. And let's call set third bit on x. It's supposed to set the third bit. It's supposed to not have changed anything, right? So assert true. Uh, x is still equal to 11. So that third bit on 11 doesn't change. Okay, so that's one test. Then another test could be, let's set x to 3, right? Set its third bit. And then make sure that it's now 11 again, right? Set, set third bit of 3. It used to be 3, now it better become 11. Okay. So those are two good tests. You can write as many as you want, but those seem good enough to me. Uh, and those could be your start. All right, let's do the same for test is third bit set. So we know, I guess we can reuse these, kind of. Uh, technically, we don't need to make a variable. Uh, so let's test that the is third bit set of 11. That better be true, right? Because it's got the third bit set. That better be giving me back true. So equals true is third bit set of 11. So that should return true. And is third bit set of 3, right, should return false. Does that make sense? So that's what I should be getting back. Uh, I don't know if I've shown you this yet in this class, but this is not how I would write these equality checks. Uh, once you get experienced enough, you sh you tend to prefer uh, the following. So, I don't know. These are equivalent to the above. Equals true, that's not adding any information. Just check, hey, is third bit set, right? It's a Boolean. If it's true, it's true. That's what a search true is going to be checking. Hey, is this true? So just, just call it, right? That's checking if it's true, right? Just the result. If it's true, it's true. This equals equals true does nothing. Does that make enough sense? 
It's like, if it, if it returns true, true is equal to true, true. It's like, it's kind of useless. If it returns false, is false equal to true, false. It's just extra work. And then also, checking is bit third bit set uh, on three, checking for that to be false, another way to do that is make sure that not is third bit set of three is true. That's another way to write that. Okay, so they're equivalent to these, but that's just another way to write the test. Okay, any questions about the tests that I made? Because they're, they're the stars of the show in TDD. Do you understand what they're checking? That kind of stuff. So then, of course, you want to run them. Test. Run the testing functions in main. Test. And then test. Set third bit. Do both of those. I guess we did this one first, so let's put it up there. Why not? And then we go and we implement these functions. Right? I'll just implement them down here. Why not? Underground. The thing that you do initially is you make stubs. They start out as stubs, your functions, so that the tests just immediately fail. Like, let's just have this one be a stub, empty body. Do nothing, right? And then is third bit set? A good stub for that is just like, yeah, you have to return a bool, let's say return true. Yes, the third bit is always set of any number, okay? And now it's up to our test to get us on the right track in terms of our implementation. So, Boop. And so just by pure luck, some of our tests pass right now, right? Doing nothing was supposed to be what you did to 11. You were supposed to do nothing to set its third bit. It's already set. The third bit of 11, yes, it is set already. You could, that is true, right? But of course, these are incorrect implementations right now. And so the goal is you see it, you see the red, and then you make it green, right? You fix it, okay? So they start out as stubs, and then you need to go and actually implement them. So set third bit, x needs to become what it was before, or with the number where the third bit is set. That's one left shifted by three, right? That's binary one, zero, 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 which is the number eight. So that'll set the third bit, and then checking is the third bit set, it's, all right, you take your number x, you and it with the number with just the third bit set, remember that? And then if it's non-zero, if it's zero, then the whole thing, huh, it'll zero out everybody if that third bit was set, or if the third bit was not set, it will zero out that result, and so the result is nothing. Uh, otherwise, it will keep that exact bit in position three set only, and it'll kind of like give back eight if it's a one. All right, so go back to the example if that is confusing. And so technically this will be converted properly to a boolean, but probably the best thing to do is check, hey, is that not equal to zero? Because if this is a non-zero result, there was a one in that position, and the third bit was set. Okay. So those seem like good implementations to me, and we get passed. Okay. Any questions about that? And if you messed up, like, I don't know, you set the fourth bit accidentally, your test should be good enough to find that, right? You want to write good enough tests to notice what's going wrong, right? Now they both fail, actually, if I accidentally set the fourth bit. But yeah, that's how you can keep track of what's working, what's not. And if somebody makes a change that breaks stuff, you immediately see red. You immediately see things not passing. And now it's time for the next feature to implement. Okay, so that is TDD in a nutshell. You write the tests first, then you do the implementation. Any questions about that? All right, for fun, before I give you your next lab, talk about the final, I'd like you to just pretend, pretend you're at a software company. There seems to be enough time today. Uh, get in your peer instruction groups, please. And have a little daily stand-up scrum meeting. Go around in your group, talk about what you're working on right now in this class, what you're struggling with, what you plan to do for the rest of the day and tomorrow to like handle to what you're working on, what you're going through. Don't take very long. It's just a quick meeting, right? You're all standing up. You all want to go home. Or you want to hear about the final or something. It's just a quick meeting. And that, that will simulate what will happen in industry. So give that a try. 
and then uh, I'll talk about your final after that. <laughs> I take another minute or so, and we'll come back. All right, that was my timer. I hope that was fun. Let us come back. I have, what, two things to talk about? Yeah. Two things to talk about. So, first thing, lab 10. Let me release it. This lab will be due the 26th, which is... Next Saturday, because next week is Thanksgiving, right? I'm not going to make it do Friday, because that's technically Black Friday, a holiday, blah, blah, blah. So it'll be due Saturday. All right? You're welcome. Enjoy your Black Friday shopping. Yay.
lab 10 is that program I was telling you about. We're going to discover, we're going to solve for a square root from scratch by repeated guessing with that binary search style implementation. All right. So uh, I have told you how to solve the problem in lecture with diagrams and words. I've not given you any code. This is this is the time for me to be pushing you into the deep end where it's your job now to write all the code. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about it. Start a code, 40, 10. Slowly but surely. All right, so here are all the files. The one that you'll care the most about is square root.cpp, but here it is. So you're going to be writing two functions, a prox equal, because this is going to be double stuff, right? We're going to have, you can't check for exact double equality, like you're never going to actually get the square root of two perfectly. Uh, and then you're going to be writing, of course, the square root function. Okay, so you're going to be writing both of those functions. Uh, got each. A prox equal just takes two numbers and it just essentially simulates checking for double equality. Like it just check if they're really, really close to each other using absolute value. And that's what you're supposed to do. Okay. So returns whether two doubles are approximately equal to each other. You can just like subtract them, take the absolute value, check if that's less than some, some very small number, right? Return true when two doubles are very close to each other and false. Otherwise, I think I give you an actual amount somewhere. Yeah. Return true if these two numbers are within this amount, 0. 0.00001 of each other. So that'll be what you check for. Okay, so that's your prox equal function. And then you have square root. You, you, it's giving, you're, you give it a double, it gives you back the square root, which is also a double, returns the square root, right? So implement it by making those repeated guesses like we talked about in class. I also want you to throw a runtime error. You can put any string inside of the runtime error, but square roots don't exist for negative numbers. So if the user tries to ask for the square root of negative one or something, you should throw it. Practicing exceptions as well. Okay. So yeah, here's the idea again. I'll explain it one more time. So for example, uh, well, I guess let me read this first. So you're going to keep on making guesses until your guess becomes approximately equal to the square root. You'll start out like the range for the answer is between here and here. I'll talk to you about that. And then uh, eventually you'll get the right thing. Unless it was negative, if so, give it a runtime error. So for example, if you are asked by the user to calculate the square root of 5, you start off with your search space, like, all right, where could the square root be? Right Between 0 and 5, you make a guess. You start off your search space very conservatively. You say, like, all right, the square root of 5 is definitely somewhere between 0 and 5. Right, That's going to be your starting range. Okay. The actual square root is somewhere in the middle, but like, for example, the square root of 5 is definitely between 0 and 5, so that's a good starting point. It's a good starting starting point for your search space, all right? So at the beginning, you need to set your search space in that way. It should have a lower limit of 0 and an upper limit of either max and 1 and x or x plus 1. Either way would work because remember that the square root of a number between 0 and 1, like 0 0.5, that gets bigger. The square root of 0.5 is bigger than 0.5. So it's not correct to say like the square root is between 0 and 0.5 unless it is. So say 1 if it's small, perhaps. Otherwise pick x, or just say x plus 1. Like the upper bound is always the number plus 1. That would also work. So I hope you see the problem, remember it. But yeah, you're going to repeatedly take your search space, look in the middle of it, and check and see if like, that is a good enough guess for the square root. If so, return that. So you'll use a prox equal there. All right. So here's an example. I have taken my code and I changed it to print out exactly how it's thinking. This is how yours should think too. All right. So here's an example on calling square root of nine. All right. It's asking for the square root of nine. You're not supposed to print out anything in your code. I'm just I did it for you uh, just to show you how the code should think. All right. So you're given x equals nine. Right? Because this takes an x. So we're in the program. x is 9. We're trying to calculate the square root of x, which is 9. So we start out making a guess, right? 
What is the square root of, of 9? I don't know. It's between 0 and 9, though. So that's my initial upper limit and lower limit. Lower limit, 0. That's my low. My high upper limit is 9. The square root lies between those two numbers somewhere, right? And then you check in the middle. That's the game. So calculate the midpoint between your upper limit and lower limit. So just average the two numbers. That's 4.5. Make sure you're using doubles. So you can get that double division, right? 4.5, and then you pretend like, okay, that's my guess for the square root of 9. Let's see if that was correct. So how do you check if it was correct without having a square root in front of you? You square it, right? You square your midpoint, which is apparently 20.25, which is way too big. That's bigger than 9, right? The square root... The square of the square root should be approximately equal to the number. It should have been 9. It was way too big. So we were too high, right? So we better guess lower. So now we know 4.5 was too big of a guess. Let's change our upper limit from 9 to 4.5. And now we just shrunk where we think the square root is. Does that, does that make sense? It's going to shrink each time. So now the midpoint between 0 and 4.5 is 2.25. That's your new guess for the square root of 9. You square that. See how close you were. Apparently that squared is like 5.0 something. That was too low. Again, the square of the square root should have been the original number. It should have been 9. It was lower than 9. So our guess was too low. That means our lower limit needs to change. Okay? Our lower limit changes to the midpoint. I know it wasn't that one, so let's just make that my lower limit. So now the lower limit is 2.25. The upper limit is still 4.5. You see how it's homing in on the right hand Slowly but surely, it's getting there. Okay, this is how you can program this to actually solve for square roots. So now the lower limit is this, upper limit is this. In between them, the midpoint is 3.375. You square that, you get 11 point something. That was, again, higher than 9, which was supposed to be what you're taking the square root of. So that means the upper limit should change. 4.5 is way too big. So guess lower. Change the upper limit. So now the lower limit is, again, still 2.25, but the upper limit becomes the that was too big anyway. So now you're looking, you're searching between 2.25 and 3.375. Okay? Check the midpoint of that. That's 2.8. Square that. See how that compares to 9. It was too small. So change the lower limit to be the midpoint again. So now the lower, lower limit's this. The upper limit's this. Calculate in between there. What's the midpoint of that? This is going to be a loop, of course, right? Keep on checking until you're approximately equal. Now that's 3.1-ish. The mid square to that is a little too high still, so we'll change our upper limit to be the midpoint, 3.09. And so, to understand the game that's being played here, you keep on changing either the upper limit or the lower limit by checking where the midpoint is and squaring it, checking how good of a guess that was. And eventually, the midpoint between your two limits is going to get closer and closer to the real square root. See how it's getting closer and closer each iteration? Each iteration, now it's 3.00, 2.99, 3.001. 2.999. Sooner or later, it's going to become approximately equal according to this definition within a very small amount, and that's when you say you're done. All right? It'll never be exact because it's doubles. But eventually, with enough iterations, you're going to keep changing your upper limits and lower limits. Boom, boom, boom. Enough times, apparently, on iteration 25, the lower limit is this, the upper limit is this, you calculate the midpoint of that, that's three point, a lot of zeros, and then a one. And you say mid squared, what's that? How does that compare to my original thing that I'm taking the square root of? It should be very close to 9. And hey, that's approximately equal. Close enough. So we'll return mid as the square root. Does that make sense? So if you're stuck, stare at this output that I made for you here. I think that will be very helpful. Maybe print it out even. See how yours is changing too. Make sure it's changing in this way for 9. Okay? But yeah, eventually the middle of your search space squared will become a equal to the original value, and that means the middle was the square root. That's the definition of square root, right? If you square it, it becomes the original value. So that's how you can do it. All right? So that is what you'll be implementing. Approx equal and square root. Are there any questions about those? Because the final thing for you to do is write some tests of your own now that you've learned about driven development, of course. So I've given you some tests already, of course, like I do. And so here's a bunch of tests for square root. Checking for the square root of 2, square root of 0.5, square root of negative 1, that better throw that exception, right? So add a couple of your own. So I want you to write four more tests. It shouldn't be too hard, right? You 
and add nine as a test. That's not currently a test. Stuff like that. So yeah, just follow my pattern, add four more tests, so four more passed in the final output, and that'll do it. This time I use a class for testing. Interesting. These are method calls now instead of function calls. So you'll get used to that. You'll figure it out. It'll all make sense. Okay? So write four more tests to check your square root. You can write a test for a proxy if you want to. That would also work. But yeah, test your code. Any questions about that? And that's what you'll be doing. So I gave you a make file. So compile using the make file. You'll say make square root test. No G++ anymore. The make file is going to do it for you. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. You're going to be turning in the two files that you worked on. So square root.cpp and square root test.cpp. All right. So that is lab 10. It'll be due uh, next Saturday. So not this Saturday, but next Saturday, the 26th, because of the holidays. It's not due Friday. Do the day after Friday. So that's lab 10. And also, I need to talk about it, your final. We're in week 15. There are 17 weeks of classes. So week 17 is the last week of classes. And then week 18 is the week of the final. Okay? Actually, I actually might need to change this extra credit thing, but we'll talk about that. So here is the week 18 module, which I'll make available to you. Most of the pieces that I want to show you, at least. So let's talk about the final. Because we are an in-person class, we have a set time uh, told by the school uh, of what the final is. So our final is going to be in this room from 3 p.m. to 4.50 p.m. on the Tuesday of finals week. It'll be Tuesday, December 6th. Okay? So there it is. Tuesday, December 6th. Exactly one, two, three weeks from today. Okay? So that's when the final will be. You almost made it. You're almost at the end. Uh, the topics, I mean, Everything is built on top of itself. I would be lying if I said I'm not including stuff for midterm one and two, but I'll try to try my best to focus on the stuff that came after that. So here's a bunch of stuff uh, listed that you can look at. I will not test you on pointer slash class stuff that I didn't talk about in lecture. For, for example, you read about linked lists. You read about destructors. Those are just to help you for 41. We're going to talk about those in detail in 41. I'm not going to test you on those in this class. Those things don't worry about for the final. Uh, and then bitwise operations is going to be the last main topic that I'll cover on the final. Okay? So everything, the format's all the same. Here's a sample one from last semester. Uh, that is the final information. Are there any questions about it? So that's when it's going to be. I think you can imagine what's going to be on it. Look at the sample exam as you do. All right, so that's the final info page. And then also... Uh, let me let me change the due date of this real quick. With every test comes a new extra credit opportunity, so we have one last extra credit opportunity for a uh, final exam review. I would like to make this due on the 5th at midnight, the day before the test is when it's usually due. So I'll change that. So it'll be due on Monday, 11.59 p.m. on Monday, if you'd like to do the final exam review. Uh, and this one is worth the big bucks. It's worth up to 5% if you're interested in doing it. Uh, as usual, no late submissions allowed. You're going to make another review video, but this time for final exam topics. Okay? Have a bunch of examples. Pretend you're me. Make sure to create something. You can just read off my slides or anything. Just keep doing what you've been doing. And then uh, that sounds good to me. All right? So here uh, are your time requirements. If you want the old 2.5%, just make another 20-minute video like you know how to do. 1.25 is a 10-minute video. But if you want the full five, you have that option now. Make a 40-minute video, okay? So double the 2.5% amount. I hope that seems fair to you. So make a longer video if you'd like and go over quite a few topics. Explain them. And this will help you. This is me forcing you to study, which is definitely a win-win for you and your peers, right? Because this is a, a Canvas discussion and everybody's going to be able to see what you post. So you'll help your peers study uh, in addition to helping yourself study, all right? So that's your final review uh, video extra credit opportunity. Are there any questions about that? So it'll be due the night before the, the final, so the midnight, 11.59 p.m. on the 5th. That is a Monday. Any questions about that? All right, you almost made it. You're almost at the end of the class. A few more weeks.
weeks to go. Then you get winter break. Yay. So I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about. Let me 